I'm not as organized, not as, as organized as Felix. So I have to spread all these things up here and figure out what I was planning to talk about. So I will finish today the discussion about fronts. And I will start tomorrow and uh, the rest, whatever is left from today and um, tomorrow, I will talk about homogenization and, and uh, evolution of fronts. Um, there is a technical difficulty, in which case I'll, I'll just do it by memory. So I, I want to close the, the story about uh, how you prove the, the limit, the asymptotic limit of reaction diffusion equations using viscosity solutions. And um, I, I want to emphasize that this is just for a scalar problem with two phases. So nothing from what I'm saying uh, works for the multi-phase problem that uh, Felix has been discussing a few days. Um, I will also show you the viscosity proof uh, for the result he presented in the case of two phases to see that uh, when it works, it gives you some very simple arguments. Uh, okay, so what did I do last time? I, I looked at this very simple problem. First of all, I derived formally using this uh, asymptotic expansion of, um, of um, uh, the method that uh, Keller, Rubinstein, and uh, Stenberg had, I show you formally uh, the, form, the expansion and show you why one expects mean curvature. And then I gave you a simple proof for, um, so I'm more familiar putting it F here instead of W, so I will put F. I show you a simple proof uh, for that problem, provided that you start with well-prepared initial data. So here F is, uh, Uh, what's that? Okay, F is either this or the other, one or the other. Okay, but uh, or it doesn't work for both, so it, it has to be either one or the other, okay? Uh, the key thing is that this area is the same as this area. I normalized everything for this to be one and minus one, one, minus one, and I emphasize it works only for one of the two. So the right one you have to figure out for one of the two. And so I show you for that for a well-prepared data, uh, meaning that is like that, where D, D here for the rest of the day will be sine distance. So anytime um, I discuss about evolution, I have to have an interior, an exterior, and a boundary. So it's positive inside, neg negative outside. Another difficulty you have in order to use anything like the distance function if you try to do multi-phase. Because if you have three phases, you don't know what is inside, outside. And uh, so starting like that, I show you this, uh, what I consider a very slick proof, when uh, you make uh, this change, variables, and uh, you prove that z epsilon goes to z, and z is a subsolution to the heat equation whenever it's negative, and uh, satisfies dz square minus one equals zero, or it's a super solution of the heat equation whenever it's positive, and satisfies minus dz square plus one equals zero, and uh, I remarked, although I did not prove that, that that implied that distance d, the z, is the sine distance of the mean curvature flow starting at u0, gamma 0. And of course, when I state such theorems, uh, I will always make the assumption that there is no interior. And um, uh, nobody asks me, 
What does the distance function approach cover in, uh, reco recover when there is no interior? So the distance function gives you the, uh, depending on how you derive it. If you derive it the way I did by doing this uh, crazy change of variables and making something to be minus infinity infinity, then it derives the, the maximal and the minimal of the front. So if you had something like that, it find, you find this and that. On the other hand, if you take anything in between and you can take the distance function from that, we'll also solve the mean curvature flow. That's the non-uniqueness. All right, so I show you the proof of that. Um, uh, I never show you that why this implies that, but the proof is complicated, so I don't want to get into that. Uh, and a side comment, uh, when anything I proved, I said I wanted to prove that something has a limit, and I said, okay, assume there is the limit, then blah, blah. So I want to show here for you, uh, as an aside comment, how one does that. Why am I allowed to say that if something has a limit, uh, why am I allowed to say, okay, I can prove there is a limit, so the limit satisfies that. Why can I always assume there is a limit? And this is now the power of the, of the theory that is behind, the viscosity theory. And so uh, typically, if you have a family of functions, let me call it u epsilon, and you want to prove that u epsilon converges to some limit locally uniformly, because the theory is a theory of local uniform, in a local uniform topology, uh, how do you do it? There is only one theorem for that, that we learn early in school. And this thing is, uh, unfortunately, I learned it to say in the wrong order, I think it's the, in the Italian thing will be Azela Ascoli. I learned from the beginning that is Ascoli Azela, and then, uh, uh, okay. And so what you need to prove, I'm sorry, this is calculus, is that the u epsilons are equally bounded and equally continuous. And if you look between the two, typically this is easy to get just prove that something is bounded uniform in epsilon. And this is more difficult. As a matter of fact, the easy case of that is if you can show that the u epsilons are uniformly Lipschitz continuous. So if somehow you have a way to prove that uh, du epsilons, I'm sorry, if you prove that they are Lipschitz, yeah, that's what I said. If you can prove somehow that this is bounded Uh, then, of course, you have the OK continuity. The worst case is we, when you, you know that things are not Lipschitz, and then you have to control somehow uniformly the modulus of continuity, and that's difficult. Uh, it's easier to obtain, uh, to prove that something Lipschitz continues than proving it's Holder continuous, because you cannot put, you cannot differentiate. And I showed you the other day that uh, sometimes getting uh, Lipschitz bounds are a problem. So how do you bypass that? So I, I will show you a, a method that works with uh, viscose solutions that says that I can pass to the limit if I have, so if u epsilons, if the u epsilon, so this thing is something that goes back to a bar per term and says the following. The idea is the following, and resembles a little bit this notion of, um, of gamma convergence. So it says, write down the largest possible limit. So I have a family u epsilon. And these u epsilons uh, solve, let's say, an equation with comparison principle. Namely, uh, if uh, date order data implies order solutions. Okay? And let's say that you have so, you know that uh, the u epsilons are uniformly bounded. So someone has to give you something. So what you do is you write down the largest possible limit And here's the important thing, the largest possible local uniform limit. Let's call it u upper star. You write down the smallest possible uh, limit. Let's call it u lower star. 
by definition, this is less than that. Okay, smallest, largest. And then the only thing you need to do is to prove that the U upper star is a subsolution of the equation, of the limiting equation, and the U lower star is a super solution. If you do that, because there is a comparison, sub has to be low, has to be below soup, but that's the opposite of this. So then you put them together, of course, and you get u upper star is equal to u lower star. And because you define equals u, and because you define that, and I'll show you how to do it as a lim, uh, as a, um, uh, as local lim soup and lim inf, uh, that implies that the u epsilons converge to u locally uniformly. So at least when you are dealing with solutions of problems in L infinity that have a maximum principle, a weak maximum principle, uh, you can bypass the need of the FY continuity by uh, adjusting this. Now, of course, I'm cheating all these places. All the data and the comparison has to work for semi-continuous solutions. So what's the definition of the U upper star? So the U upper star at x, and I'm going to assume my functions U epsilon are only functions of x, is the limb soup, as you expected that, as epsilon, U epsilon. And now I have to make it local uniform. And that's why I will put here y goes to x of U epsilon x, uh, U epsilon y. So this is what I mean by, and the limb inf is the, is the same. And uh, you need to take a little bit of care when you, anytime you write that, you have to make an, a small argument to explain why this thing is independent of the, way, the order you take the epsilon. But I think it looks very much like a, a, a gamma limit that you're going to take, you write, okay? And so anytime I say I converge, this is what I have in mind. So what happens is the Z epsilons, the, the limb soup of the Z epsilons does this. The limb inf of the z epsilon does that. And then in the background, I didn't show you that, I have a theorem that says that if I have a function that does this when it's positive, then it's below the distance function. And when it does that, when it is, I'm sorry, when it's negative, and when it does that, when it's positive, is above the distance, but then they have to be the same. All right, so that's how I do always the convergence. That's why I never argue, I never say, okay, let me show you how it converges. All right, so now I want to write down a fake problem and make the problem a little bit complicated to show you that this thing doesn't work and show you how you fix it. So, and to make it a fake problem, I'm going to put here an X dependence or I could put here a, um, a drift or whatever, but let's pay, uh, put an X dependence and, uh, uh, and uh, maintain that uh, for each x, f of x, u as this form, I mean, may go a little bit down, uh, is all of them look alike. Yes? Say it again. It's limit as uh, limit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. I said it, but I didn't write it. Maybe I didn't even say it. I don't know. We can have the replay to see whether I did it or not. Um, I, the idea is very, very simple. Okay, you write down the largest possible thing, the smallest possible thing, and uh, and then you hope you can order them. And that's what I'm saying. It's like the gamma uh, has this. Uh, okay. So look alike in the sense that they are uh, whatever they are, and, uh, and I keep the plus minus one the same to make like simpler. And I would like to get here a result that says that uh, uh, the u epsilons go to one minus one. 
and it's going to be a front moving with certain velocity. So now I want to show you how one does this. And again, I will skip a lot of the technical details, and I try to show you how to adapt, how to make, if you like, rigorous the formal calculation I show you, uh, the calculation of Keller, Sternberg, and uh, Rubinstein, and Sternberg. How to make it rigorous. So just for simplicity, let's assume again. So what happens here? Uh, we have a traveling wave. So as before, since I made that assumption, we have a solution to this problem, which is uh, strictly increasing. Uh, Q plus minus infinity of x is equal plus minus 1. Uh, but this solution is a function of, uh, so for each x, solves this problem, and um, for each x has this behavior, uniformly or whatever. So if I try to do the method I, I wrote there, I will have to do, uh, if I put here the epsilon of epsilon, I have to put here an x, okay, because it depends on x. And therefore, when I do the differentiation and whatever, I, I will get, uh, I will create extra terms. And if you remember, this calculation was made exactly to, when I saw you for that problem, was tailor-made for the problem. I mean, there were no, uh, there, uh, there was a limit, or if you like, this calculation told you that if you were to approach, to take the approach of the, of Keller, uh, Rubinstein, and Sterberg, which was to write a u epsilon as some function plus some other function, what I show you here was a slick way uh, not to worry about that. Yes? Will you solve the minus T7 plus F of Q? Yes. Uh, here, yes. Thank you. All right. So uh, the calculations, uh, the proof I showed you last week, it was a slick way to avoid this. Right? So, just worked. It's not going to work here. And, um, uh, and, uh, and the reason it's not going to work here, let me tell you the reason in advance. Remember, so that calculation, the idea of that thing was to get it to be a super subsolution of the equation that's satisfied by the distance function. But the problem here has an x dependence. Right? And you remember, if you remember, when I had the problem with the next dependence, the, dis the x, when I used the distance function, I had to evaluate things at such points. Remember that? I made a whole point that for the distance function, you can only see it on the front. So anytime, time you, write, write down, anytime you write down the distance function with the next dependence, you have to pull it on the front. And if I do that, it will mess up this nice equation I'm going to get from the z epsilon because the z epsilon is not going to see this x minus distance to the front. So it's not going to work. So what do you do? Then you go back and you say, all right, I'll, I'll do this. And so the only thing I'm going to show you today is how can you rigorously justify the formal asymptotics. But for that rigor, I'm going to cheat a little bit and I'm not going to try to justify the, the, um, uh, the um, in the greatest generality, I'm going to do it assuming that the distance function is smooth. And there's a story about that. So as I mentioned, uh, the, some people, I mean, the Motonian Satsman had proved the convergence to mean curvature for the original problem up to the first time there are singularities. And then what uh, Evans, Sonner, and I was, we found a very elegant proof to prove it globally. Then, uh, we extended that proof, so here I'm showing you an extension of that proof with Sonner, and eventually we hit a problem where that proof will not work, global in time. It didn't work, and I will show you why. And uh, so then we had to go, we went, we went back with Barr and said, uh, okay, uh, what are we going to do now? We have this very slick proof, works perfect for everything, but it doesn't work in a very interesting problem. Uh, but it works if everything is smooth. 
And that's a scene in the theory of viscose solutions. If something works when it's smooth and you get something that is, makes sense in the end, there has to be a way to prove it. And so we had to go uh, back and redo everything. And after redoing everything, we came up with a theorem that said basically, if you can do it when it's smooth, you are done. So the proof I'm going to show you today, uh, although that's why I'm not showing you all the details, because in the end we do it when it's smooth. Okay. Uh, let me emphasize one thing. There's this Q that comes in, the traveling wave. Now in the cubic case, why is the traveling wave in? The traveling wave, you can think of it like that. Far away, the limit is one and minus one. The solution will look one minus one. And you need a way to transition at the epsilon level from there to there in such a way that you don't screw up the problem. Right? And that's where the traveling wave comes in because you need to find something that far away controls, uh, it looks like it should be, and it goes down to a smooth way. Now you can say, look, I mean, if this is minus one and one, I can find many functions can go from minus one to one. In particular, let's use hyperbolic tangent for everything. But it has to adjust to the equation. It shouldn't create extra terms. So it has to be adjusted to f. And that's a real problem. If anybody can find a proof for that, uh, that doesn't require the Q, uh, uh, I will be extremely happy because I will be able to prove other problems. Now, what's the difference between this and what, uh, uh, at least in the two-phase case of the things you saw in Felix's lectures, in, uh, at least from the viscosity point of view? The algorithm that Felix has doesn't see that. The algorithm he has sees this and that. It's like seeing what the solution I wrote down, the minus one, one solution that looked crazy. Therefore, he never has to worry about that transition if you do it in the viscosity sense. And because you don't have to worry about that, at least the viscosity proof I will show you for this is very simple. Okay? But uh, uh, unfortunately, if you have epsilon positive, you need to find a way to deal with this boundary layer you create because there's a boundary layer created on, on, uh, in the transition. Because remember, as epsilon goes to zero, the whole idea is this will go to that. And so you, what you are trying to do is, is do that together while in, 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 in the BMO scheme, somehow you have taken epsilon to zero and you have one minus one from the beginning. Okay. So I, I mentioned this because there's a big open problem that in some sense in this, not big, but there is a op one problem left in all this theory that nobody knows how to attack. Uh, may not be true in full generality, but the place where it gets stuck, where everybody gets stuck is the lack of traveling waves. Okay, so you do that and uh, you plug it in and then you start seeing X dependence. All right, so if I plug that in, I'm going to get X dependence. So typically, if you have, a, if you have a, a, another question, if you have a formal expansion, I mean, Sigurd mentioned that, you can have a formal expression and somehow you put it together and prove at the end. How do you prove that uh, the formal expansion you get um, actually does the job? How do you do mathematically? You have to find a, con a way to control the errors you make. So you need to introduce in your problem something that uh, uh, will control this error. Otherwise, it's not going to happen. It's, it's going to be automatic. And the way to control this error here, and this is the essence of the theory, which allows us to do many other things, is the following. Let's assume that this is the correct nonlinearity, just to draw something, this or the other. So what I do is I, and this is minus one, and this is one. What I do is I add a little bit to the f. How much a bit I need, I, I add an epsilon alpha to the f. What does this do? This moves, if alpha is positive, let's say, the new equilibria will be, this will, will be minus one plus little uh, plus 
and uh, plus, like that. So I moved a little bit. But this is going to give me some room to work. Of course, if I move that, I lose the, uh, I lose the, um, uh, the property that the two wells have the same depth. Therefore, I lose the fact that I have a traveling wave like that. I will have a speed. So think of this as being a number, and then I will have a speed, which will be C of epsilon alpha, a speed, Q dot minus Q double dot plus F of Q X equals zero, and all the other properties. And the theory says that because F is uh, cubic, there is exist a unique C. Uh, uh, plus epsilon alpha. Okay? There is a theorem that goes back to Weinberger and so that says that there is a unique C for that. Because this is not, this nonlinearity is not more anymore equal wealth, equal uh, area nonlinearity. And it's also easy to prove in that case also that the C epsilon over alpha over epsilon converges uniformly uh, to some other constant times alpha, and this is a uniform constant, which depends on the original f. So these are facts from traveling waves. All right? This is the way I'm going to create a room. So instead of making an ex expansion like that, I'm making an expansion putting here the traveling wave that corresponds, so this is just a parameter, the traveling wave that corresponds to this small perturbation. Okay? And now I put the P here, a la uh, Keller and so on. I have to find a P, and here let's make it in, from the beginning easy. Let's put the distance to the front, and here I will put distance to the front over epsilon, x minus epsilon alpha. And the hope is that this little alpha that I introduce will allow me to control all the errors as epsilon goes to zero. And then, since alpha is arbitrary, I will let alpha go to zero and I will get my mean curvature flow. Okay, if I don't let alpha go to zero, I get a front that moves by mean curvature and a little bit of velocity. So I create something that goes a little bit faster to take over what happens. And now, you do again the calculation I, I did before, although we don't have to guess anything, and I try to do it rigorously. So if I plug this thing in, at least what I'm going to find, uh, you're going to say, okay, but how do you gain something? I will gain because to use the traveling wave in the original equation, I have to add the epsilon alpha. Right, so I plug it in. So I get one over epsilon, Instead of writing all these things, I will write Q epsilon. So I get one over epsilon, Q dot epsilon. Uh, it will be this, this minus the Laplacian. And it will be um, the uh, minus one over epsilon square Q double prime uh, DD square, which of course is one. It will be plus one over epsilon F of Q. Okay, so these are epsilons. And uh, there will be some terms from the additional x dependence. So when I compute, uh, uh, I will get a term which will be like minus 1 over epsilon. And it will come from when I take the mixed, uh, 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 mixed derivative here. So this will be 2 dx q dot epsilon uh, uh, dd. So this is, uh, this is a term that I pick up because I do the um, uh, that have the x dependence. Okay, so there's a mixed term that has to be one over epsilon. I ignore the term I get with two derivatives on x because it's of order epsilon. I will never worry about order epsilon. Okay, if you don't like it like that, just compute it and you're going to see that the dominant term is this. And, uh, and then uh, that's it. And then I get a bunch of terms from p and I only write down the ones that matter. The ones that will matter will be uh, 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 it will be minus p double prime uh, epsilon uh, with one over epsilon in front, 
And uh, I guess that's the only thing that matters here. Maybe there is one more. I think that's the only thing that matters. OK. And of course, when I write this thing down, I make a mistake. This is Q epsilon plus P epsilon x. So now I'm correct. Uh, there are more terms, but they are higher order. I don't care. So what did I do in, in the previous proof? I wanted to kill this with that. The only way I can do it is if I add an epsilon alpha and subtract an epsilon alpha. Now, this together gives me a minus. I may have messed up the, 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 the signs on the, on the alpha, OK? But I, I will see that. This thing together give me a C epsilon over epsilon squared times Q dot. OK, the traveling wave is this. I added this, so now I have this velocity. OK, so this together with that up to an error. And the error is plus 1 over epsilon squared uh, f prime at q epsilon p epsilon okay, times epsilon. I do exactly what I did in the formal computation. So this I get it because to put that in and out, I have to eliminate the p epsilon. Right? So I add it, subtract it, and I make an error. I make more errors. Again, I repeat, there are more and more errors. But you'll see what will happen in the end with the other errors. So I do that. These are the terms I count. Now, having written like that, so I replace this by this now. And now I'm correct. OK? This goes, has gone, and gave us this. Yeah, I use the equation for that. So let me write down what I have. Uh, is this clear? I made it. I, I wrote too much. Uh, I, 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 maybe I, I messed it up. But uh, it's a calculation that once you know the answer, you cannot miss how to do it. All right. So now let's put all this mess I did together. We get, and this is 1 over epsilon here. OK, so what do we get? We get minus 1 over epsilon p double dot epsilon. So let's put 1 over epsilon minus p double dot epsilon. I get plus f prime q epsilon p epsilon. Uh, I leave here some room. Equals, and on the other hand, I get all my errors, q dot epsilon uh, uh, dt minus that minus 2. Uh, what else do I have left? I took that, I took that. I have minus alpha, and I have, uh, which I will keep outside, and I have minus C epsilon alpha over epsilon square, and there is this term, minus 1 over epsilon alpha. I keep it separately. And this is epsilon here. All right? So all that together, what did I do? Yeah, it's equal to 1 over epsilon times that. OK? So, because there is no epsilon square anymore. So I have this plus garbage. But the garbage will be taken into the alpha over epsilon. Right? Alpha is fixed. No matter what garbage I have here, if it's of order one, goes into that. Okay? I will have all, all error terms, but this is alpha over epsilon, and nothing here will depend on, um, uh, will be depend, either will not have an epsilon coefficient or will be multiplied by epsilon. So anything goes, goes there. And now, you see I can finish, because this up to an error, is what I call minus alpha minus A alpha. Remember this assumption. 
plus an error that I will put it here. And now I have this expression, and what do I do? I say, okay, I need the p dot epsilon. Just to make it consistent with everything we have, uh, we can put here, okay, let me leave it like that. I have to add an extra term. And so what do we do? We apply Fremont's alternative. We say that for this thing to have a solution, this part, this thing has to be orthogonal to q dot. So we need to have q dot epsilon square. Uh, I mean, we need to have this thing orthogonal to q dot epsilon alpha. So once we make that assumption, we have, uh, we find the P, and I also find the, the, sol the equation I want, because this, me this gives me the equation, right? The same way as in the formal argument, I got the equation, that's how I get the equation here. I compute that for Q dot epsilon alpha, and I have fixed all the errors, so what did I prove? I proved this way, that the U epsilons are, in quotes, soup, or this construction, so I didn't prove that if I call this thing W epsilon and I put plus minus alpha, I proved that this thing is a super or sub solution to the reaction diffusion equation. Therefore, U epsilon is less equal W epsilon W, let's say plus and minus where the respective signs, and now I let epsilon go to zero, and I find that the front I get is above or below a front that moves by mean curvature. Because as epsilon goes to zero, this equation goes back to the original one and I get a curvature. And you see where the X dependence comes in. There will be a term like that in the equation. Right? Which, if you were trying to do it in the slick way, you will lose it. So this is a way to make the proof of, of uh, I mentioned the formal proof, to make it rigorous when everything is smooth. Okay? So, now let me explain to you a problem. How did I get this problem? I got it by saying I have a, I, I, I start with an unscaled problem, and I'm interested in the long time, long time large space behavior of the solution. So um, I have to go back. Someone asked me this question, and the question they asked me was: I said, okay, if f is um, uh, cubic with equal uh, depths, then uh, I, I do the scaling x over epsilon, t over epsilon square. And someone asked me, why don't I do x over epsilon, t over epsilon? The Keller problem I started with had already done it. So if you do the, uh, think of that, and that's an argument that appears in some lecture notes of Paul Five, which I have not seen, but uh, think of the original motivation of the problem. The idea of the problem is that asymptotically, you have a front that moves with certain velocity. So in some um, rig uh, semi-rigorous way, you can think you have an expansion on the velocity of the interface as t goes to infinity. And if you were to think of it like that, you should write that as alpha, I mean, the same, it's not the same alpha, let's say c as a first order term, plus one over t times curvature plus So that's the prediction of five. This thing, you will find it by doing this scaling, because after all, you drive for velocity, so it's normal to, to, to do x over t scale. So you should think of the result as finding the terms in the asymptotic expansion of the normal velocity as t goes to infinity. Now, we don't do that like, like uh, 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 so. If somehow there is a C that is not zero, I stop there. And when do I find a non-zero C? If the two wells are not the same, if the, this is not equal area, then I get a C. 
If the two wells are the same and I do the other scaling, I will get zero. So here I'm assuming I will get zero and I go to the next term on the expansion. And that's why I do this. Now, at some point, uh, uh, Craig Evans and I dreamed about the following result. Not for the cubic, for something simpler, for the quadratic nonlinearity, where again you get the first order velocity. What if we were to take the first order velocity, subtract, I mean, the velocity, subtract the first term, and prove, and what if we could prove exactly the formal exp the expansion? What if we could really not say, okay, when I get zero, I do the next scaling? What if I were to say, I have my velocity, I have my front, subtract from the front, whatever that means, a front that moves. And what you have left is the front moving by mean curvature. I think the problem here is how you make sense out of this idea. How can I do an expansion on the front? That will be a beautiful thing to, be, to do because they will work for many things. You have other nonlinearities where you know you have, a, uh, you have a, um, uh, normal velocity, I mean, you have first order velocity, but if you subtract it, do you get curvature? Can you carry out this idea of five rigorously? Anyway, this is not a problem I said it's open. So let's go back to that. So if there is nothing here, I get the problem which is all the way to the left. If I want to get x, it's looking like putting epsilon x here. So the problem I got here started when I have a small, the, the x is almost not there. And what you see is there is, a, is an effect that affects the equation, even if it's epsilon x. It's a small perturbation but affects the equation. If I want now, what if I want to get the problem which at time at uh, the real problem, which says that this is the equation I want, look at the long time behavior. Then you have to make, if I do the scaling, I will get to a problem after scaling, I will get to this problem now, where I have also an averaging in x. So you need to make some assumptions on f that says that uh, it's not too crazy the way it depends on x. And uh, um, yeah, let's say it's periodic, so it makes a little bit of sense. So let's assume uh, that this is uh, one periodic for now. And now this problem makes absolute sense. So how do you study this? When you look at this problem, you realize there's going to be a combination of front propagation, what I call this, um, whatever, the expansion across the front, whatever is the, I don't even know how to say that. I don't know of a term that people are using. And you have to combine it with homogenization. So what's happening is, with averaging, so what's happening is you are doing a, an exp a expansion along the normal vector, but in the meantime, you flip around a little bit. Yes? Uh, period, let's say periodic in, uh, in the uh, unit, in the unit cube. Okay. So you look at the problem and you say, okay, I know how to solve it now. By now, I mean this crazy guy you told us how to do these problems. I put here a u epsilon x t, and I put here q distance over epsilon, and I have to put here an x over epsilon. Why not? And you say, well, that's great. I know what I'm going to do. For every epsilon, I look at the Q. Is this, the, this, uh, this traveling wave? You do exactly what I did there, right? And quickly you realize that you have created so many extra terms that you cannot control. Because the terms that I got rid of here, and I said the only, only relative term, the only term that mattered was this. It's not going to do it. There will be more terms, OK? So if you do that, let's say you do, and uh, you assume that this here is one periodic, what will be the first term we're going to get? There will be a term that will look like minus q double prime minus Laplacian with respect to y. I call this argument y, 
of Q minus 2, uh, and this will be, uh, let's say, dd square, minus that, minus Laplacian 2 Laplacian with respect to y of Q dot dot d plus f of q y. All this thing is going to be multiplied by 1 over epsilon square. Trust me, it's going to be, and you can see it easily that if you take two derivatives in x here, you're going to pick up a 1 over epsilon square. So this thing I said, this naive thing, was going to kill only that, cancel only these two. But you have this extra term, and remember, the whole idea was you get rid of the 1 over epsilon square term. So that Q is not good Q. To do that, you need a Q that actually solves this equation. And these things have been studied, going back to Jack Zinn, and um, reinvented many times by Berestiki, without referring to Jack Zinn, my politically incorrect statement, but goes back to the thesis of Jack Zinn who figure out these things, which they call them at that point, pulsating waves. Okay? So what is that? For fixed y, this looks like a traveling, it look, think of it as a traveling wave in psi, which oscillates in, in, in uh, space. So you have two directions. It's a wave that way, but also it's going up and down not in that direction, in the way, okay? So think of a family of waves that go from minus one to one, but uh, they are repeating each other after a while in space. And they satisfy this, uh, they satisfy this equal zero. And as a matter of fact, if you add, uh, if f is known, let's make it like that, then there is also a term here, C, Alpha, yeah. Okay, now that's the definition of the pulsating wave. If I kill a little bit uh, equal depths, then there is a C alpha here. Now, these traveling waves, notice, they are not anymore uh, independent of the direction. They depend on that. That's why I kept it here. So a pulsating wave corresponding to a general F is something that looks like C, depending on the direction, minus Q E square minus 2 dy Q dot dot E minus Laplacian Q plus f of q y equals zero. That's a pulsating wave. It is periodic in uh, y increasing in, in psi and Again, I would put it plus minus one. I like to fix these things instead of making them also periodic, the equilibrium. So the question is, do these things exist? And then, yes. There's a dot here. Ah, yeah, 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 yeah. Thank you. All right, so for every E, there is a C, the C of E is zero if the, the F is a equal area. And under some assumptions, they don't always exist, but under some assumptions, these things exist. It's a non-trivial way, technical tri non-trivial way to prove their existence. And the reason is, if you look at this operator here, because that looks like a Laplacian in, in, uh, in Rn plus one, eh? Rn for the one. If you like to look at this problem, um, it's degenerate. It's elliptic, but degenerate elliptic. So you need to do some work to fix that. And goes, this goes back to old work, old work by Leon Zalotiru and 
and very sticky and, uh, and others. So the way you do that is you have to, you, you solve it in a big um, box because you have periodicity, you're cutting off, you cut off in space, you do it there and then you, know, you regularize the problem, you can solve it there and then you want to show that as you let the size of the box go to infinity, you get a solution. It's, a, it's a, not a very, um, it's not a difficult way to do it, but it's one of these very tedious proofs. So you would like to say, you would like someone to come and tell you whether this is true, because there isn't much you can do with that, but they're there. Okay, so what do you do? Going back to our problem now. So I did that, I know there are these ones here. I want to study this problem. So, but now I have to put a direction. Okay, before I was stopping here, I have to put a normal direction. And the normal direction is this. So I need to add an extra term. So I need to prove that somehow this gives me the answer. The, formally at least, uh, if I take a pulsating wave at the formal level, you're going to see that this will be, I will get that to be zero, so it will go away, and then it will give me the linearized operator, the linearized operator that corresponds to this, the right side has to be orthogonal, and then the velocity of the traveling wave is going to be a mess when you write it down, and so on. But there is a problem. How do you prove it? If I try to repeat the proof I said I had earlier, but make it a weak proof, namely now don't assume that the distance is smooth, but the distance is really a viscosity solution, right? So let's assume now that the distance is not smooth, it just solves the problem in the viscosity sense, so it's just ellipsis continuous, uh, semi-convex, semi-concave function, but has no second derivatives everywhere, how do I justify these calculations? Because when I start taking derivatives, at some point, I will create terms, I will create one term when I take a Laplacian to that, I will create a term that will be, will look like QEE, -E, uh, let's say Laplacian, uh, not Q, E partial of Q with respect to the direction, Laplacian of the distance. And this thing is a sin, as I mentioned the other day in the viscosity theory. If you want to have a proof that just works, and nothing else, you don't know what to do. What saves you, you look at that more carefully and you say, okay, but there's an epsilon in front. So at the limit is not there. Okay? At the limit is not there, but how do you handle it? You cannot make sense out of three derivatives. There's no maximum principle anymore. And we, this is a made up problem. We came up with this problem when we studied um, um, hydrodynamic limits for anisotropic particle systems, where there this thing comes, this non, this, uh, non um, the, the dependence on the direction, the anisotropy comes up very easily. So how do you solve this problem? And I have to admit that we were stuck for some time. And then in the end, uh, we, I think we discovered it at the same time as Giovanni and others, and uh, it was related to what uh, uh, the Georgie was suggesting at some point. And it's like, I, I think and even if it wasn't the same time, it was, without knowing each other, doing it, which uh, we came up with a, another formulation of the, of the notion of, of the motion, a very geometric thing that depending on sets, moving sets, and not functions, and then it works. So let me explain to you what I want. So definition number three, which I'm not going to write it down with all the, the details, but I'm going to draw a picture. 
So I have a set, omega t, gamma t, the boundary, and omega t, I mean, t is like that. So there is a plus, let's say, a minus, and the boundary. And the plus, this family, I will call it omega t, t. And I want to claim, I want to describe what it means for this thing to move with normal velocity v. So I'm going back to lecture one. I want to give you a definition of why this thing is, and uh, I want to call that, uh, believe me, you don't want to see the definition. I want to write this as superflow. So I want to say that this is a superflow with a velocity like that. A little bit, it's a superflow, but let's superflow of that motion. So here's what I'm going to do. And I take this to be open. I come inside, really in the interior, and I take a nice set, a ball. Okay? Now, I assume that no matter which motion you give me, I know how to find a short time existence. And if you don't, you just write down the Euler approximation to the motion. But it's too late to write this thing all down, so assume I can propagate any ball with that velocity. You give me this velocity, I can propagate it. Now I propagate the ball, however, with velocity, I, I'm drawing it like that too, with velocity v plus alpha. I'm inside. I'm inside, strictly inside. I give it a little bit more boost, whatever it's plus, minus, whatever you need to, I think it's minus, whatever you need to make the velocity. So this thing, uh, if I were to draw a picture, if this was schematic picture, if this was the omega t, what I do is I move it like that, okay, inside. And for short time, I have such a velocity, and I demand, the definition is, for small h, I have this picture for every ball I can put inside. Okay? Then you work hard and you prove that this definition yet is equivalent to what I proved all this time. It has the advantage, I never gave you the definition of viscose solution. The viscose solutions, what you do is you touch from above or below something by smooth functions. So what we do here is we touch from inside or outside sets by smooth sets. All right? Notice this alpha. This will play the same role of the alpha I, I showed you earlier. This extra speed will allow me to control all the errors I'm making. Okay, now why is that good enough? Why this, so you have a theory like that. That's the new definition. All right, how do we address this problem? So where is now? This is my u epsilon here. Huh? This is the problem I do. You know, they pay me to speak extra to speak first so you can appreciate the other lectures better which are very well written down and uh, uh, organized. So, you know, after me, every lecture looks amazing, okay? Uh, so I, I know this time because I remember both Sigurd and Felix's lectures, which were on the blackboard, how well they were here. I had to look into a mess to find my equation. Okay, so what do we do by star? We define two sets. And let's define one set. And this thing is going to be the set where the limb soup of the u epsilons is one. Okay, we know that u epsilon will go to plus minus one because we multiply by epsilon squared, they will go to that. So right here, the set where they go to one. And we claim that that set is, again, in quotes, quotes mean it's either super or subflow moving. I didn't tell you what the velocity is. Not anymore mean curvature. It's going to be a velocity which will look like there will be some anisotropic 
there's going to be an anisotropy coming up because of the excess of epsilon defend dependence. So this is like uh, this the people call the Kubo type, or, or if you want to impress people, you call it the Einstein constant. Uh, I've seen that in many papers when you know someone wants to impress, they put a coefficient and they say, we compute the Einstein constant. Okay, people say Einstein, that must be important. Uh, anyway, so that's the, uh, has many names, but it's the thing you get by averaging that coefficient, and you, you get that. So what do you do now? Now we go to the epsilon problem. So here we are at the level of the epsilon problem. This is the set omega t. Uh, you need to prove a little bit that this set is, has some, it's open, it has some interior. So you go there, you put a ball like that, and you solve the reaction diffusion equation starting with an initial data to be one here and minus one away. Right? So what I do is I put my ball, and now I, resol I solve this equation with an initial data to be one. So if you like the picture, I'm here at the slice t0. I put down a ball. And now my solution is somewhere there, and I put an initial data which is how less than one doesn't matter, and like this. But no matter what it is, if it is minus one, it will be below the the u epsilons because the u epsilons will never be minus one. And since I'm inside the ball, I can say that if this is one inside the ball, I can make everything to be like one minus delta. So my solution being like that is below. So that's the u epsilon. The u epsilon t0 will look like that. Will be, I didn't put that one. I put it a little bit less than one, but that's not a problem. So that's the picture I have. But the reaction diffusion equation satisfies maximum principle. All right, so that implies that u epsilon t plus t0 is greater or equal, let's call it phi epsilon of t, where this thing is the phi epsilon. But now I have a smooth boundary, and I know how to prove things when everything is smooth. I can do everything I claimed. All these things, this thing, I can do it if everything is smooth. I, I told you a little bit how it works. And so what I have is I do this inequality, and I know that in the smooth evolution of this, with plus minus alpha, this thing goes to one, right? Because that's the smooth proof I, I claim I can do. So the phi epsilons, as, uh, they go to one as long as, okay? But if this goes to one, that goes to one, which implies that the, this definition holds. Because I just proved that I have my set I think this should be liminf. Where am I? All right? Because what I proved is the set that moves with velocity v plus or minus alpha is inside the set I want to claim that is a superflow. And that's it. I verify the definition, I have the result. And in the end, the only thing I had to do was do the proof for the um, smooth uh, distance function, nothing else, provided I have this definition. So I have to say this was a little bit anticlimactic because you know, we worked very hard to find these very beautiful and slick definitions, and at the end we said, okay, it didn't matter. I mean, we just had to, uh, not definition proofs. And then in the end we said, well, that's it. But I consider this, I, uh, 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 that's something I did with Gibral, I consider this a nice result because it took care of a lot of problems and, okay, here you may say you are, this is a made-up problem, but these problems are not made up. Perhaps the homogenization is made up. But the real case where I, one can find equations that are, I would call them, these equations, non-local in the sense that they see the, a lot of the white dependence. Or, but there are real equations. Let me give you an example of one that uh, comes up, I mean, run, time runs out, so it's not possible. I went too slow the first days, and I'm paying for this. Ah. 
Let me write down for you an equation that um, if you think that's made up now, here, let me tell you what you are going to see here. Okay, so let's take J to be non-negative and just to simplify things, compact support. And, uh, and even. And let me write down this equation. So if you don't see what I have here, I have hyperbolic tangent, beta j convolution u. All right? So you look at the equation and say, okay, it's early in the morning. Maybe I'm doing what Luis said he's doing with uh, local equations, with non-local equations. I'm just creating jobs for people by writing down complicated equations. And I want to do exactly the same problem. I want to understand the long time behavior of that. Why do I want, and I will explain to you what happens. All right, this equation is not made up. Ah, what is phi? Phi is a, is a function, of course, that, it's, it's going to be very illuminating what I'm going to write down now. Phi is a function that has the property that phi of r is psi of minus 2r, 1 plus e to the minus 2r, now, the, now I wrote that, people say, okay, now we understand uh, what phi is. I mean, we're clear because I introduced psi. Okay, so um, uh, where is, uh, so where did this come from? Suppose you take the following particle system. So now we forget all that stuff. We are in Rn, in, Z, in uh, Zn. And we do discreetly, I, I don't want to write more points. This is a lattice. And we do, if you like, the discrete BMO scheme, which, by the way, was discovered before Osher described the BMO. This is due to, uh, uh, to Griffith and uh, Tarver. And, uh, and they did that as a simplification of the Ising model. So suppose you have a discrete front. This works very well in the United States. They did it as a voting model. But there is a, there is a version for multicolors, right? So suppose you have, let's say we are in the US. We are either Republican or Democrats. And there is an island, let's say the uh, west side of Austin near Northwell Hills. Northwest uh, Hills, where people vote Democrats. That's a very small area. Actually, the district goes all the way. Uh, there is a district that starts from Austin and goes like that, all the way to the Gulf of Mexico, and just captures here the, the, the place that only votes the uh, Democrat in Austin. OK. That's where you live. And I live there, so I, I understand that. So, and there are elections. And you're here, and you decide how to vote. So this has uh, this are the, so this is uh, some set. And you're here and you decide how to vote. Uh, let's say you're a little bit further there. So what you do is you find a neighborhood. Ah, that's too big. I'm here. I'm, I'm finding a neighborhood like that. I'm intersecting with what I have. Okay? And if the points in the intersection is more than a threshold, I go Democrat. And if I'm below, I stay Republican. And I keep doing that. This is exactly the BMO scheme. The difference, instead of having a neighborhood, in the BMO scheme, you have the Gaussians. Instead of counting, you integrate. Right? So you do that. So this way, some points go there, they go. And if you let this thing evolve and you scale it properly, you get motion by mean curvature. Okay, 
Um, but nothing is probabilistic here. Now let me make this thing probabilistic. The voters now will be spins. So the voters are going to be either plus one or minus one, or if you like, uh, the spins are either Republican or Democrats. And I repeat this process, so I have now a spin in the location X, which is uh, plus minus one. So now I work on the space on, uh, uh, what is that, an L infinity of, uh, I mean working functions with, from Z, ZD into minus one, one. And uh, I do exactly the same thing, but I allow two randomness. Actually, one randomness. When I decide to check. So I'm sitting there, and then I have a clock. And that clock has the property to ring randomly. It's called Poisson clock. So at some point, this thing goes bing. Then you wake up, you say, okay, time to vote. You count your neighbors, and with a certain rate, so you have an energy now. The, the energy decides what happens in your neighbors. So there is an energy, and also there is an external magnetization. There is a magnetization, which could be the advertisements you, read, you watch. So the, magnet, the advertisements magnetize you and decide to go in a certain way. So depending on something, which depends on the number of neighbors you have that have the same spin and some external factor, you decide whether you vote this way or the other. Right? Now, all these things, I can write them down. And um, this is where the Psi comes in. Um, it's incredible to say, well, how the heck do you get out of that a hyperbolic tangent? Uh, it, it, it's an amazing thing what you can do when you work with functions that have values only plus or minus one. Okay, you can get a lot of things. And in particular, this comes up because you, in the rate you define, you have to do it in such a way that there are Gibbs measures, there are invariant measures. So that problem was uh, uh, one of the big problems that people had in statistical mechanics. And a lot, there was work in Italy by De, uh, De Masi and uh, Presuti and, and others, and that's how I learned uh, uh, these things. So if you take that model, now how do you, what, okay, that looks nice, but how do you make a PD out of that? What you think when you write that, uh, um, Probabilistically, you can write uh, all these things down considering a generator. Uh, so I didn't tell you what the gamma, uh, this is J gamma, uh, no, there is no gamma here, sorry. So what matters here is now what happens in, in uh, how you define your neighbors. You can decide to look at only your immediate neighbors. So if you are like that, uh, four points, nine, whatever, nine points. That is called short range interaction. Or you want to look at many points, and that will be called long-range interactions. Long-range interactions has been understood much better than short-range interactions because they are difficult. Okay, I will tell you the result for that, but not the general result. One case. So here we are doing long-range interactions. So which means I'm going to scale our potential by such j of uh, x minus y of gamma, gamma d. Okay, I do something like a convolution. And um, no, I have not divided times. So I'm, I'm allowing the support to go to infinity. OK, I, I just need a couple minutes, uh, maybe five minutes. I know I'm at the end, but I entertain you a little bit. I mean, you know, I, I, I told you a lot of jokes. So take, I mean, I just need to finish this so I don't have to do it next time. Um, so you start something like that, and what you evolve is a, a measure on the space of uh, functions with value minus one, one, and defined on the ZD. And so what you care about is the evolution of a measure. So you have some initial configuration of, of spins, and you just evolve it. And you scale it to see what happens. And the first scale is a mesoscopic limit. In the modern language, this will be mean field limit. And you find how does the evolution, so this is the measure, that's the configuration of the spins at time t. 
you call that thing M of gamma xt, and you try to see how this thing evolves in time. And it turns out that this has a limit as gamma goes to zero, and that limit solves that equation. Okay? So, but probabilistically, the way to think of it is that the measure, the, this actually limit is more complicated, but this quantity, so if you like, the evolving measures converge weakly to a Bernoulli measure where depending on where you are in space has a mean given by that equation. But the probabilists really care to see, again, what is the shape you get. So you have to do, you say, okay, that's clear. What you do, you start with the particle system, you let gamma go to zero, you get the mean field equation, the mesoscopic equation. You scale it like before. And you discover the Einstein formula. You find a front like that. But the, the, the statistical physicists don't care about that. Statistical physicists, they don't know that. They know it, but they don't know that. They want to go directly to here. How to go from the, uh, from, from the particle system directly to the evolving front. The result there will be that properly scaled, this thing converges to a Bernoulli measure, which depending on whether you are inside or outside the front is equal its mean is equal to the equilibria of the, of, the, of the problem. And this is indeed the case. If you have um, large inverse temperature, so in the regime where this is, this is the average, there exists a rho star such that for every epsilon gamma going to zero slower than that, if you scale uh, the limit as gamma goes to zero, or the evolution of nu gamma of p t epsilon gamma minus two goes to zero. So this looks like the actual scaling I did. Looks, this looks like one over epsilon one over epsilon square, but it's not frozen. It will depend on gamma, and it has to go. There is a whole continuum of scales you have which is due to the fact that you have the hyperbolic, uh, you have the particle system, so there is more room. And, uh, and so that's what the, uh, the actual result, that to prove it, you need to do this thing, because this thing is anisotropic. All right? So I conclude with a picture. Take the discrete, uh, let's, take, uh, let's take the BMO scheme. If you start initially zero, the scheme will give you zero. And so there's no front. Probabilistically, I will call that, let's start with a great picture, equal number of pluses and minuses, so when you average you get zero, there is nothing. But in time, probabilistically, and this doesn't change because this is deterministic. But if you look at computations, and actually this can be proved, although I don't think anybody has made the connections with the two theorems, if you do the same thing probabilistically, so let me assume I uh, have configurations that have mean zero at time t equals zero, and you let it move. In time, that is like logarithm, a very small time, logarithmically small. You are going to observe randomly now, these are random sets, some blobs, let's say, of black. Or they may be white and black. But you start seeing some crazy things. This is a Monte Carlo computation you do, and you see that. 
And now if you go further in time, these things will move with the isentropic, anisotropic mean curvature. So what happens is, although we start with zero, there is again some kind of random effect that forces you away from the equilibrium, and then you start moving, and then you get the mean curvature. And that's the advantage of the probabilistic thing and that. And finally, the real conclusion, I told you long, -term, long time interactions. What happened with short term? I think that's some work that Spawn has done. Uh, I don't know the exact statement, but one way to get reaction diffusion equation out of this model, local, in particular, you can pick up this equation probabilistically with particle systems, but with local interactions, so you only care about what the neighbors do, but you have to include an additional process, and that's stirring. So what you do is you have a way at every point, not only you see what your neighbors do, but you stir the thing. So it's, it's, and that's a way of putting in the Laplacian. So the, the, the nearest, nearest neighborhoods, they give you this, and you combine it with the Laplacian. And that is called Kawasaki Dynamics. And that was the first thing that, uh, and who, what was the name of, um, who, the, of the Italian who did it in, uh, in the smooth case? Um, if he doesn't remember, I, I refer to the person. So it's Giovanni's fault that it's not named. <laughs> we don't have it. Uh, okay, I'll stop here, and then, then next time I'll do a little bit of homogenization, but next, I will not resist and show you the viscosity proof of the two-phase case of, the, of uh, whatever. Okay, so thank you very much. Go have coffee and uh, whatever, and uh, if anybody has any question, you can ask me. This is my most valuable person here. You see, the chalk, he asked for the chalk. I'm advertising this. I'm having some money. I'm getting some